starting in the book of Galatians. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's one of the most frequently cited books, uh, claiming to refute your messianic perspectives. Y'all talked about that. We talked about that and how it is, uh, often gone to. So we have started by establishing the Apostle Paul as a, as a reliable witness and a voice to listen to. You know, and that has sadly become necessary to try to establish that because even in many messianic circles, they, they don't always like Paul. Or they think that he is the main reason for the birth of what is, you know, perceived to be this, this pagan Christianity. Well, on the flip side, what's, what's interesting is that he's also not liked among many uh, in the church, especially many liberal Christians who think that he's too Jewish or he's too misogynistic or legalistic or whatever else. So the, the sides are criticizing him in almost the opposite direction for, the, for many of the similar things. But we were looking at how he had the approval of Peter, James, and John in Jerusalem as well as the calling of Yeshua himself on the road to Damascus. So to say that Paul is not somebody worth listening to is to basically say that those guys were all wrong in their assessment of him and his ministry. And you're saying even that Yeshua was wrong for calling him in the first place. And we looked at this, you know, the Lord said to Ananias, go, for he, talking about Paul, is a choice instrument to carry my name before the nations Kings and B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. Paul is God's choice, Yeshua's choice. He was elected to the role, that important and necessary role of carrying and bearing the name of Messiah to the nations before kings and the children of Israel. But we also looked at that passage out of Second Peter, how how uh, ignorant and unstable people will twist. Paul's writings, and it was a reference to uh, being put on the rack where things are getting torn out of joint, tortured. They have tortured Paul's writings to say some things that he never really meant to say, to say some things that we shouldn't try to make him say. And so is, is Paul responsible for that abuse of his words? No. The people who twist them are responsible for that. And so if he is one to be listened to, then we need to take a closer look at the purpose that he wrote this letter in Galatians. Because Paul largely, he starts these congregations during his missionary journeys, and he comes into town, and many people, and even many Gentiles, believe his message about Messiah and Yeshua. But the problem comes that after he's left, after he's moved on, and after the, the mission that God has for him has carried him into new places, others have come in behind and began to say that Paul was wrong in what he taught them. And you shouldn't be listening to him. You should be listening to us. And so he's writing to address that and to steer them back on the right course. And he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from the one who called you by the grace of Messiah to a different good news, a different gospel. Not that there is another but only some who are confusing you and want to distort the good news of Messiah. So there are already some that are trying to twist and distort and torture his teachings. It goes on in verse 8. Says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should announce any good news to you other than what we have proclaimed to you, let that person be cursed. And as we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you good news, other than what you receive, let that person be under a curse. And that's an important idea to keep in mind for some of the things that come later. And he is, with this book, with this teaching, he is so focused on the discussion of justification. He is so focused on what it means to be justified before God, to be considered not guilty before God. And that idea of justification, that's the, the heart of the gospel, that's the heart of the good news. But it is the gospel, it's the good news. We need to understand that it's not something new. We tend to think of it as it's only a New Testament concept or an idea. It's not something that just showed up when Yeshua did it. 
What Paul taught was not something that he came up with, but was consistent with what was the good news, what was God's gospel all along. And our trouble comes because we point out that the Torah is about sanctification. The Torah, the terms of the Mosaic Covenant, those were added to those who were already delivered and they were saved, they were justified. But the Torah wasn't added to save. We talked about this last week, but to change and make holy. We looked at the Torah and talked about it in the sense of it being his discipleship program for his people. But again, that's not what Galatians is focusing on. It's focusing on justification. And we don't get to add to the gospel. We don't get to add or change it in, in order to be saved. But neither should we take away from the proper order of things of what comes next or how we are made holy. But this plan this gospel, this good news, is not something that we can just play around with and willy-nilly try to change and alter to what we like. That's what St. Paul says. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the good news proclaimed by me is not man-made. I did not come up with this. I didn't make up this. I didn't change this. I'm not trying to alter the course of God's redemptive plan. Says, I did not receive it from any human, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. And that is a remarkable, remarkable thing. It's a statement that we too quickly read over without realizing its implications. When he talks about the scriptures. When he talks about these things being man-made, I didn't receive it from any human. I didn't. I, it came through a revelation of Messiah. You know, he's talking about these things in terms of where they fit in the scriptures. And remember, Galatians being the likely the very first New Testament book written, the only scriptures he's talking about, the only scripture that he's drawing from, is what. It's the Tanakh, it's the Torah. The Tanakh as explained, as detailed, as proclaimed, and you know the primary of this the primary focus or the essence of this word, you know, good news and proclaimed is that word evangelize. You all heard that one before, right? To evangelize, to speak and declare the good news. But the primary element of that, of that is that the gospel was even explained to Abraham. I seem to be missing something here. Yes, I am. I'm missing this verse. This is the scriptures. Foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Proclaim the good news that, that evangelized to Abraham in advance, saying, All the nations shall be blessed through you. So, not even Paul had the ability or the authority to change this good news because it's been told for quite some time. And so the gospel, the one that Paul is teaching, the one that he is proclaiming among Galatia, is going to be consistent with this. It's going to be consistent with this good news that was given even to Abraham. This gospel of God, this redemptive plan of God, that was not made up by Paul, it wasn't made up by any man, but that the Messiah, Yeshua himself, Revealed to Paul was, again, it's first revealed to who? It's first revealed to Abraham. The gospel, the good news, was all the way back there. It wasn't just 2,000 years ago, like we like to think it is. 
but it was in the life, in, in the, you know, not just 2,000 years ago, in the life of Yeshua, in the life of the apostles. It was 2,000 years before that, during the lifetime of Abraham. So again, it's not the gospel, the good news is not a New Testament idea. It's not, a, it is God's idea. It's a Torah idea. It's an Old Testament idea. And so we'll be looking at the gospel as it is in the Old Testament. And one of the challenges that this has been for me this week is, is what not to talk about. You know, instead of making it a six-hour message, which it probably could have been done, I'm trying to be nice to y'all just a little bit. And this is the challenge. So I know I'm not going to address everything and every passage that could come to this subject, but we make that point a little stronger that the gospel, the good news, is not a New Testament idea. But too often when we grew up in church, myself included, when we think of the gospel, we think of three major points. What? The death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. And when we think of the gospel, we think that's it. That, that is the gospel. <laughs> If you get people to believe that and you've successfully shared the gospel and someone has been saved. Now, again, understand the death, burial, and resurrection, are those important? Yes. Is that the key to everything that happens? Yes. Without that, would we have anything to talk about? No, we wouldn't. So it is an essential thing, an essential elements that make the whole larger plan, the redemptive plan of God, even possible. So without the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah Yeshua, the, the gospel, the good news, the plan of God wouldn't be able to move forward into the days that are still coming. So it's essential. But the idea of the gospel was already present in the Jewish people. The Jewish people, they already had some understanding of the good news even if they, like we, get some elements of it wrong. And before Yeshua's ministry even became public, the gospel was being proclaimed, and his cousin John knew it and proclaimed it. And John shows up, because in those days, Matthew chapter 3, John the Immerser came proclaiming in the wilderness of Judea, Turn away from your sins, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He preached about repentance. He preached about the kingdom of heaven. And people responded with repentance and with uh, with uh, mikvah, with going to the baptism. So then Jerusalem was going out to him in all Judea and all the region around the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were being immersed by him in the Jordan River. So these are essential elements of the good news that existed within the mindset of the Jewish people long before the death, burial, and resurrection ever took place. And I know it's part of the gospel because that's how Yeshua's ministry started, with that same message. Mark chapter 1 says, Now after John was put in jail, Yeshua came into the Galilee proclaiming what? The good news. The gospel of God. Because so now is the fullness of time. Now is when the moment has been leading to and bringing us to this time. He said, and the kingdom of God is near. Turn away from your sins and believe in the good news. He hasn't even told them about the death, burial, and resurrection yet. And he is telling them to believe it. That means that they've already heard many of the elements of it. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is near. So this good news is already a concept within the Jewish thought long before the events that we in traditional Christianity think of as the gospel. They believe something already. So the gospel, the good news of God, is, is his idea, is a Old Testament idea, is a Torah idea. So what is the gospel in the Old Testament? 
then what is the gospel that Paul preaches that's different? Because what he because since he's not allowed to change it, he's not allowed to add to it, he's not allowed to subtract to it. Anything that Paul teaches that is led by the Holy Spirit will be, must be consistent with what has been revealed in the Torah. So you think about what was what's the first element of the gospel. When you look, when you ask most Christian commentators, because they focus again on the death, burial, and resurrection, they would start with what is called the Proto-Evangelium. Anybody know where that is? It's a nice fancy word. It's the first gospel indicator from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where it talks about that statement that you know you will bruise his heel and he will do what? Crush his head. Yeah, the serpent's head. The next one that comes just a couple of verses later is uh, 321, where God is providing the skin. He's providing the sacrifice to cover their nakedness. You know, that, the idea of sacrifice, that idea of atonement. And they do provide a sense there, an indicator of the order of what must happen you know, before the fulfillment of the gospel can take place. We're going to talk about that at a later time. But to, to see the Father clearly beginning to reveal the gospel, We've got to start with that verse from Galatians chapter 3 telling us where to start looking for it in the Old Testament. Again, the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, proclaim the good news to Abraham in advance, saying, all the nations shall be blessed through you. So to start finding the gospel in the Old Testament, it's when God begins laying out the details of his redemptive plan, we need to start with Abraham. And that starts with the call back in chapter 12. It was as an Adonai said to Abram, get going out from your land and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. So my heart's desire is to make you into a great nation, to bless you and to make your name great so that you may be a blessing. This is the start. God's good news, you know, which as it talks about his heart's desire. That he intentionally works to accomplish this goal starts with this calling, this choosing out, this bringing out of Abram from this larger group. It starts with a promise. It starts with the promise of the land. Starts with the promise of becoming a great nation. Come, starts with the promise of blessing. You know, being a great nation, having a great name, and that idea of blessing. And then the promise of being a blessing to other people. But my desire is to bless those who bless you. But whoever curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So he's being a blessing to others. And when Paul comes along in Galatians and says, if anybody is telling you another gospel, let him be what? Let him be cursed? It's because that's the language here. When you're changing the gospel, when you're getting away from the God's redemptive plan, there is no, you know, blessing in that. And blessing is again, you know, it's repeated in the good news. It's as as is protection, as is defending, you know, it's cursing those who curse. It's repeated again, this idea of blessing to others. In particular, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. I mean, those, even those that that Abram is not even related to. Can they experience the blessing? Yes. They can experience the blessing that is bestowed to Abram. They can come under that good news. All the families can experience the blessing of God through Abram. And so, in, in other words, you know, all, for all the families of the earth, all the nations, if they want to experience the blessing of God, they must come under and make themselves a part of what God is doing in Abraham and his descendants in the land of promise 
And because apart from that redemptive plan, that good news, there is no blessing. So we're going to come back to that, you know, but understand that this is the key element between Paul's gospel, Paul's gospel, and what the others are preaching. When they're preaching another gospel, they're missing these essential elements in here. There's the idea of the descendants of the land, of the nation, and blessing. You have to understand those and keep those ideas together to understand the gospel in the Old Testament. And that, or as John the Baptist put it, he's talking about what? He's talking about the kingdom. These elements are all about the kingdom. You know, it appears again in Genesis 15 at the cutting of the covenant, both descendants and land are part of the promise, part of the good news. He says, he took him outside and said, look up now at the sky and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to them, so shall your seed, your descendants be. In verse 18, on that day, Adonai cut a covenant with Abram, saying, I give this land to your seed, from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. He goes on in uh, verse 10. God said to him, Your name was Jacob. No longer will your name be Jacob, for you will be Israel. And so he named him that Israel. And God said to him, I am El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. And this he talks about now a nation and an assembly of nations will come from you. From your loins will come forth kings. The land that I gave to Abraham and to Isaac, I give, to, give it to you and to your seed after you, I will give the land. So you see the land and the descendants. But now you also start seeing more about the kingdom, about the nation, about this kingdom. We see a gathering or a the Hebrew word there is kahol of nations. And what's interesting is both of these words, a nation and an assembly of nations, nation and nations, are both. Forms of the goy, the goy, which is usually how we think of the Gentiles. But still, here we are. We've got the, the elements of the gospel are the descendants, the land that form a nation that also does what else? What comes with them? As they are made into a nation, then what comes with them is an assembly of other nations that are a part of it. So then when we get to, when we look at Hebrews chapter 4, we are reminded that the gospel message was given to a later generation among Israel, the Exodus generation, so that they would continue, could continue to be receiving the promise of the good news. But ultimately they didn't quite receive or experience the fullness of the gospel, even though they heard it. And we're so close to it. In Hebrews chapter 4, he said, Let us fear then, though a promise of entering his rest is left open, some of you would seem to have fallen short. For we also have had good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the word they heard did not help them, because they were not unified with those who listened in faith. So the guy who was writing Hebrews in their day, in the life of the apostles, had the good news explained to him, but so did that generation that existed before. And that generation is the one that came out of Egypt, but didn't make it into the promised land. And only two of them did. And that's Joshua and Caleb. The rest did not because they did not believe, they did not trust, they did not hold fast to God's redemptive plan. But they heard it. And then he goes on to say, So then it remains for some to enter into it, yet those who formerly had good news proclaimed to them did not enter because of disobedience. They did not enter into the promise. 
They did not enter into that rest, the land of promise. They did not become the nation in the fullest sense that God had wanted them to be. <clears throat> Of even what God had already described. So the gospel, the good news, was not fulfilled in that generation. The gospel still awaits a future fulfillment that is yet to come. Verse 8 says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So there remains a Shabbat rest for the people of God. So there is still some things to come. There is still a future where the gospel is fulfilled. They are still waiting. We are still waiting for all the fullness of the gospel to be revealed. And so in the gospel in the Old Testament has descendants. You know, it's talking about a people. It's talking about that land of promise. It's talking about a nation that gathers nations. It is talking about that rest or that enjoyment of God's provision and rule. That's all a part of the gospel. This rest in the rule of God, this kingdom with a righteous king, you know, is supposed to extend far beyond even the borders that were given back in Exodus. It's not supposed to, it's supposed to be much bigger than just going down into Egypt into the Euphrates River. When uh, Zechariah describes it in chapter 14, he says, Adonai will then be king over all the earth. In that day, Adonai will be one, Echad, and his name one. So God's kingdom, in which you know Israel will be a prince over all the earth. And even though other nations will rise and grow powerful in, all, on, on the, in history during all these times, they will all be struck down by God's kingdom, and only God's kingdom will remain. And according to Daniel, God's kingdom will rise higher than all the others, be unshakable, be unending. This is all part of the expectation of the understanding of the gospel that, that the Jewish people were believing and holding on to. So in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will this kingdom be left to another people. It will crush and bring to an end all of these kingdoms, but it will endure forever. Again, that's the gospel. It's part of what they were understanding when they talked about the good news being fulfilled. This is what they're waiting for. This unending kingdom in this, with this righteous king. The righteous king will judge the wicked. He will elevate the righteous. He will, his will will be done on earth. And so as the description of the gospel continues, we see a gathering of the nations before, or within this kingdom, before this righteous king that they're waiting for. You see that in Daniel chapter 7. It says, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, it was brought into his presence. And dominion, glory, and sovereignty were given to him. So that who comes before him? Just a small number of people, a limited people, just one people? Is that all that comes before him? No. It's all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, one that will never pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. That's part of the gospel. The nations coming to this king is part of the gospel. In the generation of the Exodus, they heard it. They heard the gospel. They heard what kind of special people they were supposed to be in God's eyes and in his plan. In Exodus 19.5, he says, now then, if you listen closely to my voice and you keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me a kingdom of Kohanim, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to Bidea's right 
That's part of the gospel. That's what they heard. They were being, the Jewish people, being a treasure in the eyes of God, being priests and set apart. That, that's a good thing, right? They should look forward to that being fulfilled. This belief, this teaching carried over even into the New Testament era. That the, the Israelites are essential for this God, this plan of God, this redemptive plan of God. They have a special and important role in fulfillment of the gospel. Romans chapter 9. He says to them, talking about the Jewish people, belong the adoption and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the Torah and the temple service and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, the Messiah, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So they have not lost this element of the gospel. They have not lost this idea of identity and calling and how important that is and how significant that is. Even Peter talks about this continuation of these ideas of what is the good news showing up in the New Testament. First Peter chapter 2, again, it says, You are a chosen people, ones who have been brought out of a larger. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation a people for God's own possession, that special treasured possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. This idea of being a people, this idea of being a nation and a treasured possession, and that's even in the future. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And from Messiah Yeshua, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, koanim, or priest, to his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever. So the gospel again, is pointing us to the kingdom. The redemptive end and purpose of God. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, puts it this way, You have made them for our God a kingdom and priests, and they shall reign upon the earth. And so since that idea existed already in the minds of the Jewish people, the gospel was something anticipated. The gospel was something they were looking forward to. They were looking for its arrival and their place in it. And so the message of promise is, is the good news, and it's repeated even in the prophets. Again, it's in the Old Testament. In Nahum, it's there, especially in Isaiah. But you also start to begin seeing some of the, the verses that, again, are twisted and distorted that might make them get off course. Nahum chapter 2 says, Behold, upon the mountains are the feet of him bringing good news, proclaiming shalom. O Judah, celebrate your festivals, fulfill your vows, for never again will Belial pass through you. He has been utterly cut off. So again, you're bringing good news. You're proclaiming peace. And interestingly enough, when you are living in the fulfillment of the gospel, what are you supposed to be doing with the feast? Are you still supposed to be keeping them? Yeah. But some focus more on this part down here. Focusing on Belial. Focusing on this exclusion or the cutting off of Belial, that they'll never again be there with you. See, it shows that some, not everyone is welcome to participate in this good news. Is how it was sometimes taken. As a distortion of really what it's supposed to be. Isaiah chapter 40, 
says, you'll get yourself up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Zion. Lift up your voice with strength, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Lift it up, do not fear, and say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Or Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Who announces shalom, peace. Who brings good news of happiness. Who announces salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. Again, it's there. Or another place in Isaiah 61. It says, the Ruach Adonai Elohim is on me. Because Adonai has anointed me to proclaim the good news to me. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. That's an important part of the good news. And this is where some of the, the growing problems with the, with the understanding of the gospel in the Old Testament that even the Jewish people had. It's statements like some of these like in Nahum and such, that caused the Israelites to forget these those important provisions, that the Israelites, while they are God's treasured possession, that's true, but it started to move into a sense of superiority, and a sense of pride, and a sense of this is for us. They forgot that when that statement was given back in Exodus chapter 19, that they were still a mixed multitude at the time. They were not one people. They had various ethnic backgrounds. And so they read descriptions of the fulfillment of the good news, you know, the kingdom of heaven coming in power and glory. They're often in the context of judging the unrighteous or the wicked or even judging the nations. And that is still good news. Because God is a God of justice. And he is a God of righteousness, and wickedness will not prevail. But the hard part is, is that some of those that are among the nations are still drawn to God. Aren't they? Even though they are in those groups that are not that treasured possession, they are still hearing the call. And rather than including those nations, many Israelites began to believe that God wasn't interested in it. And we read about that when you hear about the debates between the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai, how Hillel you know, was willing to find or give a place to the Gentiles, but Shammai didn't want, didn't, said they couldn't have a place at all. So that question of do the Gentiles have a place in the kingdom, and they, so they, by even asking that question, they're forgetting this key component of the gospel. And they were going to have, they were going to, Abraham, Abraham was going to have descendants. They were going to be this treasured people. They were going to have this land of promise, this kingdom that would endure forever. They were going to have this righteous Messiah king. And they were going to rest in God's provision and rule, but they were beginning to forget this part. That they were going to be a nation that gathers the nations. So by the time you get to the New Testament era, many Jews in the New Testament era didn't believe that Gentiles could be a part of or experience any of the gospel. They would never be God's treasured possession. They, these Gentiles would only know his judgment. God would never, Gentiles would never have a place in the kingdom. They would never be a citizen. The Gentiles, these pagan and unrighteous people, would never be accepted by Messiah. Again, they would only experience his judgment. They would never know God's rest because they had no hope. They were without God. So the only way that any Gentile could experience any of this good news, any of the blessing of God, is by ceasing to be a Gentile and becoming or converting to be a Jew. But if that's the only way that this could happen, if that's the only way a Gentile could experience the gospel, 
then this can't really happen. Where he says a nation and an assembly of nations. Because if only Jews are able to experience the blessing of the gospel, then you're only you're not going to have a nation and an assembly of nations. And if Shammai's plan is followed, it won't be Jew and Gentile coming together as one new man. It will just be one man from one nation. And see, with that plan and with that attitude of Shammai saying that the Gentiles don't belong, there's not going to be any desire to even see this come to pass. To reach out to the nations, to invite them into God's house. There's no desire to be the, the, the light of the world or the light to the Gentiles and the nations. They'll just be like, hey, if you show up, great. It's good to have you. You're lucky. You made it. But we're not really going to try to go and find you and bring you in. See, that's not who Israel is supposed to be. They're supposed to even follow Abraham's example. Remember, he's when you've been in the Torah club lately, he's known for what kind of feature about his life. When he has, when he sees people along the road or there are guests around, he shows what kind of life. He shows hospitality. He's known for sitting at the front of his tent and welcoming those passing by, and he invites them to join in and become under his, the blessing of his home. And if you've been reading about the Torah, the Torah portions about Jacob and Isaac, I'm sorry, Jacob and Esau, then you would have read the blessing given to Jacob and also the one given to Esau and see how they are connected. Genesis 27 says, may, is Isaac speaking to Jacob, he says, may God give you from the dew of the sky and from the fatness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. He says, may people serve you and may nations bow down to you. Be master over your brothers. May your mother's sons bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and may those who bless you be blessed. This blessing given to Jacob, overflows to those who come under this God-ordained order of things. What Jacob is given overflows to these that come and work this way. Those who bless Abraham, those who bless Jacob do this. Those who curse them are refusing to be in this order of things. The same goes for Esau. Esau will experience the blessing so long as he doesn't rebel against and throw off the yoke of his brother. Genesis 27 verse 39. This is out of the complete Jewish Bible. Isaac, his father answered him and he says, Hear, which means behold or see, now, most of your translations will say, away from the richness of the earth and the dew of the heaven from above. But in reality, the language is most what is saying here, look, this is, this, your home will be of the riches of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. Where are they going to experience that? Where would Esau experience that? When he's here, when he's with Jacob. You, you will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. That's where Esau experiences the blessing. But when you break loose, he will shake his yoke off your neck. See, Esau still has the opportunity to be blessed. Esau enjoys the blessing or the fatness of the land and the dew of heaven so long as he accepts the order of things and coming under Jacob's blessing. And the same is true for the nations. The Gentiles can be included. The Gentiles can be blessed by joining themselves to the people of Israel through the firstborn of Israel. That is the Messiah. 
Gentiles too can enjoy the benefits and the blessings of the gospel. We too can be justified before God by believing the gospel. And this is this is Paul's gospel that some were forgetting about. That the Gentiles are to have are are and have been included in that redemptive plan of God all along. Ever since Genesis chapter 12 and the calling of Abraham, God's desire was to bless all the families of the earth through what he was going to do in bringing out and separating and creating a nation and keeping all the promises given to Abraham and his descendants. And it was those who wanted to distort that reality to say that the Gentiles didn't belong. Those were the ones that were preaching another gospel. It was those saying believing in Yeshua is not enough. Saying that Messiah is only for the Jews, that you Gentiles must go through another process. You've got to you know, formally convert to Judaism. Otherwise, Messiah isn't for you. But neither Jew nor Greek, Greek are acceptable. Right? Neither one of us, Jew or Greek, are unblemished and completely righteous before him. And so it's not so much about the change that we make to ourselves to do something like conversion, but it is the change that Messiah makes to us that makes us acceptable. And both Jew and Gentile have to experience that, that part of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2, these are these passages that we know. Therefore, keep in mind that once you, you know, you Gentiles in the flesh, were called the uncircumcision by those called circumcision, which is performed on flesh by hand. So, you know, you're not one of us. And you won't be one of us until you become one of us. He says, at that time, you were separate from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. We've looked at these passages a lot. But these are the heart of the gospel, and all of those things are true. But you have to go through that process of being converted and going through circumcision, that whole legal process of that, in order to have that situation change? Do you have to do that to yourself before you be acceptable? No. Now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. It's in him that our identity is changed. It's in him that we come under that blessing. It's in Yeshua that the gospel is fulfilled in making a set-apart people, a holy nation, you know, this kingdom of priests uh, that serve as citizens of the kingdom of God under the rule of this righteous king. You know, he came and proclaimed shalom, peace, to you who were far away, and shalom to those who were near. You who were far away are the Gentiles. You who are near both needed to hear the good news of peace. For through him we both have access to the Father by the same Spirit. So then you are no longer what they would always say you are. Being in Messiah is enough to have your identity changed. You're no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with God's people. You have been brought in. You have been accepted. And you are members of God's household. And you have been built on the foundation made up of the emissaries and prophets with Messiah Yeshua himself being the cornerstone. See, the gospel was there in the Old Testament. And there is no different gospel. There is only God's unchanging and redemptive plan. But its meaning and its fulfillment can be disrupted and distorted and turned into another gospel. And both sides can do it. And when we do that, we miss the full blessing 
you know, for the Jewish people in this day, it was not wanting to include the Gentiles at all. For us Gentiles, that's what's developed in years after that and for a long time since. We want to keep ourselves separate and apart from the Jewish people. That we're essentially throwing off that yoke. Just like Esau was prone to do from time to time. Refuse to be one with our brother. Refuse to work with our brother. And so, when, But when we do that, when we throw off the yoke, what else are we throwing away? We're throwing away the blessing. And we're also throwing away the key important parts of what is God's redemptive plan and the gospel. The gospel that includes either the option to not include the Gentiles or the option to not want to have anything to do with the Jews, guess what? That kind of gospel only brings a curse. So we must not turn away from the truth of the good news that's found in the Old Testament, that's found and brought to light by Yeshua the Messiah. And so he comes to this and says, I am amazed that you're so quickly turning away. Because we've got people on both sides that want to turn away and not fulfill key elements of the gospel. And for most of our background, most of our history, most of us growing up, you know, in Christian history has been one that is turned away and rejected the connection with the Jewish people, not wanting to come under that blessing. But we don't, we don't want to be the ones that are quickly turning away from the one who calls you by the grace of the sign to a different good news. And again, not that there is another, but only some who are confusing you and want to distort the good news of the sign. But even if we or an angel from heaven should announce any good news to you other than what we have proclaimed to you, what has been proclaimed all along, let them be, let that person be cursed. As we've said before, so now I, I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you good news other than what you receive, let that person be under a curse. And that's the curse that goes all the way back to Abraham with his call. So we need to be sure that we're not confused in what the gospel is. The gospel being that whole picture of God's promise, culminating in the kingdom of God when Jew and Gentile are united together as one new man, as citizens of one kingdom under the righteous king. That's when we can, we're going to have shalom. That's when we're going to have rest. And so when he's talking about this, we need to understand his what the gospel truly is. Amen. I hope that 